Friends, good morning and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Portland, Oregon. We are a creation care congregation, a peace church, and a reconciling church. My name is Ethan Gregory, and I am one of the pastors here. Today in worship, I'm joined by our senior pastor, Reverend Donna Pritchard, our pianist, Shelley Edwards, our soloist, Jonathan Green, and our wonderful tech team in the back, Lindsay McGill and Jean Balcom. A couple of announcements for us this morning. Reverend Andy has started a new creative and spiritual practice project for us. If you find yourselves sitting at home in need of something to do or a way to help you pray and be in connection with God, uh, Reverend Andy is inviting you to copy and write down a chapter of the scriptures. All you need is just some paper and your favorite pen or marker. Uh, contact Reverend Andy and he will assign you a chapter of the scriptures to write down. And at the end of quarantine, we hope to have what we're going to call our quarantine Bible to put on display in the library and remind us of all the ways in which we were in prayer and contemplation together throughout the last year. Also, continue to join us each Wednesday at 6 p.m. over Zoom for Pastor's Bible Study. Reverend Donna, Reverend Andy, and myself each take turns leading this time of learning and connection with one another. And so, friends, the Christ candle is lit on the table. A reminder for us in this season of Epiphany that our God in Christ Jesus is indeed the light in the midst of the darkness that keeps coming. But we know that this light extends from this chapel and into our homes wherever we find ourselves in worship this day, reminding us that we are indeed united as one, as God's people, and as the people of this congregation that we call our home and that we call First Church. And so, friends, with the light lit, let us now extend signs of peace and reconciliation to one another. I invite you to do this with those with whom you're worshiping with in your home, or I also invite you to take out a phone or a device and send a text or a message to a friend or loved one and let them know that the peace of Christ extends to them this day. So friends, the peace of our God in Christ Jesus is with us. Let us enter into worship together. God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me and I will follow you all of my days. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. And step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Friends, let us join together in the call to worship. The word of God came to Jonah when he listened and when he did not. The word of God comes to us when we listen and when we do not. God calls us in spite of our fears. In the midst of our doubts. In the face of our resistance. In the moment of our rebellion. Still God calls us. Let us listen today. So be it as we worship, and as we live. Friends, as we continue our worship this day, let us enter into prayer together. God of love and grace, 
continue to surround us this day as we worship together, that through our singing, our praying, our entering into your story and our story, we might be reminded of just how much you love us and that this love might eradicate any fears we may hold so that we can go to the places, dream the dreams, do the new things that you keep continuing to call us to do and be. And so let us continue to worship together. Amen. This morning, we are going to be hearing a lot of scripture, but we're going to do it in a different way. We're going to have a paraphrase of the entire book of Jonah. Now, this is a uh, Hebrew scripture, and it is a satirical commentary on what happens when we don't listen to God's call upon our lives and also what happens when we cannot accept that we might be wrong. So Ethan and I are going to retell the story of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah heads for the first travel agent around and determines a little vacation is just what he needs. Someplace nice and quiet, maybe someplace far away. He found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went on board to go with them, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. It was a dangerous situation. The next wave might overtake them entirely, and the whole ship, its cargo, its crew, and everyone else on board would be lost. So Jonah said to the sailors, Take me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now, the sailors did not want to do this. They tried everything else they could think of. They exhausted themselves trying to row the boat back to shore, but it was all to no avail. So they took Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. 
And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Jonah prays, and God hears his prayer. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So at last Jonah did what God had asked of him. He went to Nineveh and cried out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them, and even the animals. Jonah prophesies, and the people repent. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God repented of the evil which God had said God would do to them, and had compassion on them. God sees their repentance and forgives the Ninevites. He will not destroy them after all. But that displeased Jonah greatly. He was angry. So Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, Is this not what I said when I was yet in my own country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew you are a gracious God, merciful and slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Therefore, Lord, now take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah just can't believe that God's compassion could extend all the way to those horrible Ninevites. And God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Jonah goes off to sulk. He is angry, furious in fact, to have been so wrong about God's care for a great enemy. The Lord God made a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. And Jonah was grateful for the plant. But when dawn came the next day, God sent a worm which attacked the plant so that it withered and died. And when the sun rose in the sky, God appointed a sultry east wind and the sun beat down upon Jonah's head so that he was faint. And he said again to God, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said, You are concerned about a bush which you did not even grow, a bush which lived only for a day. Why should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, where 120,000 people live? And this is the story of Jonah, who got everything all wrong. Grace and peace to you from God and from Jesus Christ who calls us into community this day. Oh, Jonah, could there be a better example of what happens all too often when we are caught off guard by our own mistaken biases, fears, hopes, or dreams? Jonah had such a hard time. He just could not find a way to be rightfully wrong. The story begins with Jonah's disobedience. It was too much what God was asking him to do. Why would he care if Nineveh were swallowed up by God's fury? That's what Jonah thought. He said to himself, wouldn't that really be a good thing? Because Jonah, like all good Israelites of the time, he hates Nineveh, an evil empire, and its people are great enemies. Undoubtedly, Jonah thought he was doing the sensible thing, the same thing you and I do every week, countless times, when Jonah decides to run away from God. He thinks to himself, why not take a little short notice vacation to Tarshish? Why not pretend I don't hear God calling me? Why don't I pretend I don't understand God's mission for me? 
Surely God will give up on me, will leave me alone, if I can just run away fast enough and far enough. But then, as they say, the best laid plans go awry. The waves come crashing against the boat, and even the most experienced sailor is terrified. For some reason, Jonah admits to the real reason for his trip. And after some encouragement, the sailors do the only thing left to do. They throw Jonah into the sea, not expecting that God is going to catch him on the way down. And in the belly of that great fish, Jonah cries out to God. Isn't it interesting how all of a sudden, the only thing Jonah wants is a direct, face-to-face -face kind of relationship with God. Gone is the urgent need to flee from God, and in its place is the pleading, beseeching cry of someone looking for God's face, listening for God's voice, begging for God's help. So the fish can't quite stomach Jonah, who could blame it? And there seems to be no recourse left for Jonah but to admit that he was wrong. He was wrong to quarrel with God's plan. He was wrong to run away from God's mission. Wrong to think he could hide from God's calling. There is nothing for it but for Jonah to go to Nineveh. But the thing is, he still doesn't get it. He still does not quite understand the point of the whole thing. He goes only so far, hiking grudgingly into the city and giving them the world's shortest evangelistic crusade. Forty days and you are toast, he tells the Ninevites. And then watch what happens. The evil people of the most evil empire believe Jonah's warning. And from the peasants all the way to the king, they put on sackcloth and ashes. They repent and they turn their hearts around like Jonah never can. Well, that makes Jonah angry. He's not just a little peeved, mind you. He is furious because Jonah's hatred is far greater than God's mercy. That is why he fled in the first place. He wanted no part in the salvation of his enemies. God brought him face to face with his own hard-heartedness, his own political and nationalistic bias. And he just could not admit that maybe, just maybe, he had been wrong. The story ends with Jonah bitterly quarreling with God. He is denying the errors of his thinking, not necessarily because he is too immature, insecure, or pig-headed to admit to being wrong. Surely Jonah had been surprised by God's capacity for forgiveness. He had not expected God's grace would extend all the way to the people of Nineveh. But in his denial, Jonah is not responding to the facts of God's action as much as he is responding to the feelings those facts evoke for him. Feelings which were apparently too great for Jonah to bear. You see, Jonah's belief, his worldview, which told him who was right and who was wrong, who was to be embraced and who should be cast out from God's love, all of that was inextricable from Jonah's own identity, his own sense of security. 
So it is no wonder he goes off in his anger to sulk, just like we do. Whenever we are overwhelmed by the feelings evoked in recognizing how wrong we may have been, Catherine Schultz, in her book, Being Wrong, writes this. Seen from the outside, denying error looks irrational, irresponsible, and ugly, while admitting it looks like courage and like honor and like grace. And sometimes it also looks extremely hard. Right now, my friends, in this nation, in our own community, even in our families, we need to find ways to be rightfully wrong. We need to find the courage and the honor. We need to embrace the grace required to admit our mistakes. And likewise, we need to find the compassion for those who are bound up in the pain of mistakes which feel like a threat to their very sense of self. Perhaps the only way we will begin to heal the divisions which keep us apart and threaten the peace of this land is to recognize that being wrong is not a sign that we are a failure. Rather, being rightfully wrong that is, recognizing our wrongness with all the humility and openness we can muster. That is one of the ways that we will begin to grow up. Again, in Schultz's words, it takes courage to leave our past selves behind. But it takes even more courage to carry some token of them with us as we go, to accept that we have erred, to recognize that we have changed, and to remember with compassion our caterpillar past. My friends, if we are to emerge from the chrysalis of our mistakes, and if we are to inhabit the butterfly souls offered in God's love, it's not necessarily going to be easy, but it will be well worth it. As difficult as this can be, the dividends are well worth it. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened next. We don't know whether Jonah finally caught on to what God was trying to say, that it does not matter who you are or how many times you have been mistaken. It does not matter how fast or far you try to run away from grace. You can never be outside it. You can never be beyond it. The story is unfinished. And likewise, our story is not finished yet either. My hope for us today is that we will get up off the ground, that we will get out of our self-pity or our denial or our fear. My hope is we will get out of our own way and become at last rightfully wrong for the sake of ourselves, for the sake of our neighbors, and for the sake of our common future. With God's grace, we can. Thanks be to God. Amen. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, 
May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I say. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. Friends, we enter now into the time in our service in which we respond to the God whom we have met and worship this day through the giving of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Instructions for giving online by credit card or by check in the mail can be found on our website or in your bulletin. The web address is fumcpdx.org give. And now, as we prepare our hearts to give, let us enter into prayer together. Continue to change our hearts indeed, O oh God. Turn us by your grace. Help us to follow in the way that you invite us and call us to go. The way of love, the way in which we pursue perfect love, that love of you and that love of our neighbors. And as we take the first step this day, might it be one of extending that same grace that we have received through the giving of our gifts, tithes, and offerings, that through giving, our friends and neighbors in our community and around the world might experience the same grace that we have. In the name of the one who is love, we pray. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Pray. 
is God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia. enter now into a time of reflection and response. If at any time you would like to spend a little more time at one of these stations, just hit pause on the video and then you can resume it when you are ready. We'll begin at the prayer station. As Ethan lights a few candles for us, you are invited to bring to God those things closest to your own hearts this day. We come now to the Wisdom Wall, where you'll find a few quotations meant to inspire your thinking and to free your thoughts.
now we offer this poem for your contemplation. It's a poem by Cavi Jesse Hockaday entitled, Humility Got a Bad Rap. Humility got a bad rap because it seemed too close to weakness. The ego did not understand its great benefits. All it saw was the specter of its own death, and thus humility was cast into the wilderness. Only the wise can be humble. Only one who understands love and the eternal can whisper softly. Humility is great strength and the peaceful pacifier of conflict and war. But it got a bad rap. And now, no one even talks about it. Finally, we find ourselves at the Creative Arts Station. As you think about the story of Jonah, Jonah certainly must have felt humbled when he realized how wrong he had been about God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness. See, I invite you now to take out a journal or a piece of paper, whatever is at hand, and jot down your response to these questions. Do you remember a time when you had felt humbled? What was that like for you? What feelings were evoked in recognizing you had been wrong? What were you able to learn from this experience? Whether I cry out your name or I feel all alone ashamed, you are not gone, you are there. Whether I notice your hand in all the stars, the sea, the land, whether or not you are there. Bidden, unbidden, I know you are there. You are present always, again and again. If I forget you or join you in prayer, you are present always, forever Amen. If I don't feel you around, there is no picture and no sound. I will believe you are there. Even on my darkest days, I will still sing a word of praise. 
I will believe you are there. Bidden, unbidden, I know you are there. You are present always, again and again. If I forget you or join you in prayer, you are present always, forever. Amen. My friends, it is true, bidden or unbidden, whether we are aware of God or not, God is present with us in every moment, giving us the grace to move out of the chrysalis of our mistakes and to recognize what it is to be rightfully wrong. May the peace of Christ be with us all. Amen.